Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Tim Dillon Show. Uh, we appreciate it. We're back on Saturday nights. We were all over the place this summer uh, in terms of uh, releasing. Um, but we're going to remain for the foreseeable future on Saturday evenings. Um, and thanks, everybody, for all the messages and well wishes uh, and things that you... Uh, sent me about um, the death of Evgeny Yev- Prigozhin, um, <laughs> who's a uh, was a kind of a, a part of my life <laughs> and a factor, um, a force in the last several months, um, and I appreciate that. And uh, it's sad when these things happen <laughs> because we don't we barely know. Uh, we we knew this man for a little bit, and I felt like there was more. To come, um, certainly the American media was saying that. They were saying that there was more to come from him. <laughs> they were very excited about uh, what was happening with him and how much uh, the Russians were, you know, that Putin was going to, It was he was down bad. Putin was down bad. <laughs> and he was really like, it was a rough, people were like no longer respectful Respecting him and this guy Prigozhin, he had attempted this coup. It didn't work. The president of Belarus stepped in and negotiated a deal, which seemed eh, at the time like, you know, maybe it would be a little bit of a setup. Uh, <laughs> and but then this guy gets blown out of the air uh, with all of his top like lieutenants, assistants. All the commanders of Wagner Group, you know, the his private military. Because what's interesting about this guy is he's he is a warlord. Like he's, he started out selling hot dogs, and he then makes inroads with Putin. They're both from Saint Petersburg, and that's the thing about Russia. It's kind of like a clash of clans. You have people from Saint Petersburg, people from Moscow, you know, like Shogu and Jerasmanov, and all these other guys are from. You know, wherever they're all from, they all have these, they all grew up together and they all have these certain little mafia units that they are a part of. And this guy and Putin were buddies from when Putin was like a young guy. Putin was just like a dude uh, in the local government. And him and uh, Prigozhin became buddies. And Putin kind of helped him out. And he helped him out. Prigozhin had spent like nine years in jail because he like choked a woman out, stole her pocketbook. He was a rabble rouser and he was, um, you know, uh, incarcerated in a, in a, in a, in a no joke, real deal Russian prison. And then came out of that, started selling hot dogs and then became, they used to call him Putin chef, Putin's caterer. He starts catering, you know, there's photos with him. Get the photo up of him serving, I believe it's George W. Bush. He was serving... Yeah, he's there. He's Putin, hold on. Well, he's serving Putin, but I think Bush, there's... there's there yep. you go. There you go. There's Prigozhin. Isn't that fun? <laughs> For the Bushes are somewhere in Texas now being like, Remember that guy that served us borscht when we were in Moscow? <laughs> he tried to take over Russia, and then Putin blew his plane up. But what's interesting about this guy, right, he looks like any sommelier you'd see at, like, a New York restaurant, any ma- maitre d', maitre d'. He was, a, he was a warlord, cutting people's heads off. But right there, he's like, you know, he looks like a sommelier mm-hmm. serving... Our leader at the time, GWB, in the Kremlin. It's, he was a. It's funny to have those two sides of you, to like have an appreciation for cuisine, and yet also end up someone who would behead people in the street, which is what he, you know when they raided his uh, Wagner PMC headquarters or his house. I was reading that like he had photos of the people he had beheaded. In in uh, like in his house, we had photos of like the heads that he had taken off. It was like Colonel Kurtz, a little bit uh, Apocalypse Now, but it started. You know, you know he was a, a chef, and and Putin brought him in. He started making a lot of money, 
He started the Wagner PMC, which was this private military contractors, this private military group that Russia would send to do certain things that they needed done. Syria, whatnot. They did a lot of work in Africa. There's a lot of African warlords that are upset that this guy's dead. They're not happy because he would go in there with Wagner and he would provide private security to African warlords and they would give him, uh, they would give Russia mining rights. And a lot of the Wagner is very, um, they're very, uh, you know, uh, engaged and active in, in, uh, on that continent in Africa. And, you know, so Prigozhin is like, a, he's a cartoon character in the sense that he was a hot dog salesman who then became this kind of high-end caterer. He also, you know, furnished meals for the Russian military. That's where he made the big money. He made a lot of money. He became a billionaire. He's an oligarch. But he liked killing. He liked killing people. And he was good at it, and he was good at talking and dealing with killers, rapists, murderers. Like, even Putin, get up the Putin quote uh, after he died. Putin said something interesting. Putin was like, he made mistakes in his life. I, by the way, you got to love the way Putin talks. Number one, Putin, they, they clearly did this, right? They cl- his plane was clearly, they uh, put a bomb in it or whatever. And But Putin, you know, the Kremlin comes out and goes, no, no, hey, this is... This is, you take a chance when you fly. The Kremlin's got to go out and go, no, 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 no. Every time your plane takes off, you got to say a prayer because you just take a chance when you fly. It's not a, it's a, it's weird that he tried to do a coup and that his plane had a malfunction. It's, the timing is odd, but this is not us. This is not us. Putin goes, I've known Prigozhin for a long time since the early 90s. Putin describing him as a talented businessman with a complicated fate who made serious mistakes in his life. But what I love, Putin said, is he also, Putin goes, he got uh, the necessary results. Prigozhin, when he was talking about him, because he has made mistakes in his life and he, he's, he got the necessary results. He did the things that needed to be done to get where we needed to go. And the Western media, who they, like some of them have an understanding of Russia. A lot of them don't. A lot of them don't. I don't know where they get a lot of the stuff they get it from. I don't know if it's fed to them directly from the CIA or if they just, you know, watch movies and just think that they'll just go, well, that might be the way it happened because it, you know, happened in a movie. Like, I don't know where they get any of this stuff. Like the CNN article that I posted, and people were like, well, that was 10 days before he died. It was like, CNN was like, Prigozhin is large and apparently in charge. It was a, let's get this article up. It's interesting because it shows the disconnect. And I knew when Prigozhin was going to die, by the way. I knew when he was fucked. I knew when he was fucked. And and we'll go into that. Um, uh, And it, it, it was a moment, and it was after that attempted coup, and I said, God, he's not thinking. Um, so CNN, where in the world is Wagner warlord Prigozhin at large and in charge, apparently? And this article that we're going to get up is just basically, uh, it's so, it's the disconnect is, is, is very, very apparent. If you, like, just think of how things in that part of the world work. Like, you don't, you don't get away. It's not America. You don't get away with it. Like, America is still a really fun country where you can do shit. You can run into the Capitol with horns on. That guy's doing interviews now. I think he's he might be running for Congress, the QAnon shaman. Like, in America, it's still fun. You could still do things for the gram in America. It, it's like, it, it, as long as you're willing to get progressively crazier... In America, there's genuinely a way, like if Trump just said, I'm not running for president anymore, he's like, I'm done. I'm going to go back to hosting water balloon fights. Everybody get their tits out. <laughs> I'm going to be nasty and rude. He, There would be billions of dollars behind him to do anything he wanted in the media space. The reason they're indicting him every other day is because they don't want him running for president. And he's done some criminal stuff for sure. But that's why they're indicting him. If Trump had said... I'm going back to entertainment. 
the money would have lined up behind him. And it, it, it didn't matter about January 6th. They wouldn't care because they go, they just have more money with that guy. We can make more money. He'll do another show. He'll do another apprentice. But this time, and we'll, it'll, they'll make a fake set that would have looked like the White House. They would let him sit in a fake <laughs> Oval Office in, in, in L.A. somewhere, in Burbank, in his studio, and he would fire people, and he would be the fake president, and he would be nasty and rude, and it would be great. And no one would remember January 6th. You know, President Bush, you know, with Guantanamo Bay, torture, Iraq, Afghanistan, doesn't, no one cares. He's on Ellen. He's, uh, look, he's painting. Look at the horse he painted. Mm-hmm. It, 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 we forget, as long as you're willing to get progressively crazier, like, if you did all that shit, like, Bush, you just have to show up on Ellen and go, now, I'm a painter now. I'm painting. And that level of insanity we respect. He's an artist. The guy that dragged everybody through the war and tortured all these people and destroyed our image abroad is an artist now. So as long as you're willing to go crazier and crazier, you can figure it out in America. It's still why it's the greatest country in the world. Because Donald Trump would have been fine if he just left. There's no route for Prigozhin to do a game show. <laughs> There's zero route. That's not how Russia works. That's not how it works. You can't go be the host of Wheel of Fortune after you've tried a coup. But in America, you can. If Trump was like, listen, we got a little... Uh, People got together, they got a little wacky, they got a little, out, you know, it's, it, it, then he would go, listen, I get it, it was a little nuts, we, but, but now we're back on streaming. Amazon, Netflix, every single, all of these people, when they had assurances he was no longer going to be the president, when they knew he was out of political life, when they, when they knew he was done, they would have opened the vault of money for him. Fox, everybody, because he's a magnet of eyeballs. They don't want him running the country They're for a myriad of reasons, but they want to watch it. They love him. The media loves him. They adore him. There's enough. They can't get enough of him. They want to hear him. They want him to call people names that they hate. They also hate Ron DeSantis, but... They want Trump to destroy Ron DeSantis. They want him to call Ron DeSantis' names. But but because he is currently still, amazingly, the front runner for the uh, presidency, they, you know, he's going to be indicted. They just indict him, indict him, indict him, indict him, indict him. And we just bury you in paper because we're not going to blow your plane out of the air here. We're going to bury you in paper to prevent you from running for president. But they don't care about him, like, there was a route for him to just go right back, slide right back, and become uh, a media uh, kingpin. I think he was interested in that before he got elected. He was interested in a Trump TV, something like that. He could have taken the whole Fox News audience. It would have been his, and nobody would have cared, right? Just in in the same way, the the thing is, when I knew Prigozhin was going to die, is when it, when it look at this photo uh, and by the way, let's read a little bit of this article, too, here, because this will make some of my uh, point for me. It is why America, by the way, is still far and wide the best country to live in. It's the greatest country to live in because there are there are roots to redemption in this country that do not exist anywhere else. There are roots to redemption in this country that don't exist anywhere else. And a lot of them have to, they live in the entrepreneurial world. If Kevin Spacey comes out with a meal plan (laughs) that's good, he's back, kind of. I'm telling you, we will forget. If he comes out with some uh, vitamin water type thing, you can do it. It, you can it you can come back here and we will suck you dry of the last of your money but Russia's the old world America's the new world and in the new world perception is everything we manufacture reality is what Karl Rove said we're an empire when we act we manufacture reality it is what we say it is but in Russia it is not in Russia, 
It is the old world and beefs are settled in a very old world way. Like blowing your plane out of the sky or you get shot in the face. People in Russia, you know, uh, uh, leaders of opposition parties, people that have challenged uh, Putin, journalists, uh, people, they get shot in the face there. It's an old system. There's no route to redemption in that country the way that there is in America. You cannot go host the view, Rosie O'Donnell. Like, you know what I mean? It's like you you have a fixed amount of possibilities in Russia, in the old world, of how it's going to work. You're going to be rich. You're going to be dead. Those are the two possibilities in that mafia. That's mafia. Mafia rules. Rich or dead. It's mafia rules. In America, we got, oh, man, we got options. <laughs> we got, you think you're rich. You're famous. You're famous and not rich. You're both. You're dead, half dead. You've come back. You've got a thing going on with fucking uh, Netflix. You have a podcast. You were a mob rat. Now you got a podcast. <laughs> you're back out with all the guys who ratted on the mafia. Everybody's on a podcast. <laughs> Reading ads for Blue Chew. <laughs> because it's still the greatest country in the world. That doesn't happen over there. That's not the case. If you're a rat, it's over there. Because they don't have the monetization. They don't know how to make money off people they would otherwise kill, like we do. In Russia, you just got to kill the people that bother you. You just got to kill them. In America, you can kind of let them fuck around. Late last week, imprisoned Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny was handed a harsh judgment. After a court hit him with a 19-year sentence in a penal colony, he was sent immediately to a punishment cell. It was a stark contrast to the fate of Yevgeny Prigozhin. Again, so the person who's writing this isn't aware that they're talking about Russia. They think they're talking about America. And the reason that I knew he was in trouble, get the photo up of the guy taking the selfie with him. When he was leaving Russia, look at this. They're doing it for the gram. He doesn't get it. Prigozhin doesn't get it. He signed his death warrant when he did that little march that he was doing at Rostov on Don and then on the way to Moscow, he fired on military helicopters and killed Russian servicemen. He can't not be killed. Putin would have no credibility. He was always going to be killed. Every dummy in the press corps over here from the Atlantic to the New York Times are like, well, yeah, this is interesting. Putin's, uh, it's a real, like, uh, you know, pretty embarrassing that this happened and this guy's running around. It's like, no, he's not going to be killed uh, the next day, but this was pretty soon. This was pretty good. And I saw that photo. I said, fuck, he's dead. He's dead. He's dead. People are taking selfies with him. He thinks he's in America. He thinks he's in America. He thinks he's going to get an agent. So look at the pictures of him smiling with the people. He thinks CAA is going <laughs> to sign him. He thinks there's another way out because the internet's powerful and I'm sure the CIA and all these people are giving him, feeding him all kinds of crap. Like, no, no, you come over here and we'll look the other way. You know, you, you know, there's probably something for you to do, you know. He wants very much. He likes fame. He's kind of delighting in it. This is a guy that was cutting heads off. He was a warlord. Dude, get the other photo where he's like, yeah, there he is. He's happy. He's ebullient. This was a guy who was a few, uh, 48 hours before this photo, he was trying to overthrow the government of Russia, which didn't work because people in Russia go, no, 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 no. Well, it's the mafia. We're, we're all getting paid. We're, we're, it's like, we're, we're in the, it's a, we're in cahoots here. We're in cahoots. It's a, it's a whole, what are you doing? He's like, the people have been lied to. And everyone's going, yeah, we know. We're, li we're lying to them. What do you, what do you think you're going to come in? What do you think you're, you're going to come in here on some, like, white knight, white horse, ride in, tell everybody. And they know he's a warlord. It's a corrupt warlord cutting heads off. This isn't Thomas Jefferson, and I know Thomas Jefferson wasn't Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> Don't bother me with that. But my point is that they all know this guy. They know him. That the warlord is cutting people's heads off. He's going to come in and... No, they're all be in they're enriched by the Putin regime. And they're going, dude, you, you, he thinks he's going to get support from all these guys. Because some of them probably don't like the Ukraine war. Some of them are like, it's fucking our money up. But they know that the reality is 
they, they've got all their money with Putin. They've got all their eggs in that basket. So he finds out they're not coming over to him. He's not going to go whack the Don in front of everybody. It's not going to work. So then he's like, oh, fuck. He goes, well, we're not, okay, sorry. I made my point. He did this thing. He did this like about face where he goes, hey, I made my point. I, you know, I killed a few Russian servicemen. By the way, that's not forgivable. None of it's forgivable to Putin, right? Well, it's not really. So he then reverses course and the, the leader of Belarus goes, he'll come to Belarus. And then I saw these photos and he's leaving and he's doing the celebrity thing or maybe that's when he arrived in Belarus. I don't know. But he's taking selfies with people and he's smiling and he's happy and I'm going, he doesn't understand his fate. Or if he does, he did a great job disguising it. But I think he got a little in his feelings, as people would say, and he started to believe his own myth and he started thinking like, I just fucking smacked one of the most powerful men in the world in the face and he did nothing. And now everybody's taking selfies with me. Everybody loves me. I'm fun. I'm back. I'm in. But unlike America, you can't go host Miss Universe again, which Donald could have. And I'm not saying they're, I'm not equating them. I'm just saying in terms of the paths to redemption, there aren't any in Russia. You, it, you just live and die by what you did. Not so much what you can do. So Prigozhin takes all these photos, and here's this article that shows kind of the misunderstanding of that. It was a stark contrast to the fate of Evgeny Prigozhin, the head of the Russian mercenary group Wagner. Back in June, Prigozhin led the abortive mutiny that presented the biggest challenge to Russian Vladimir Putin in over two decades of rule. While Prigozhin's troops stopped short of Moscow, a furious Putin said in a televised speech that those on the, quote, path of treason would face punishment. Almost two months later, in the case of the Wagner chief, this simply hasn't happened. And then they did cover themselves. They go, clearly the price for confronting Putin is not fixed. Perhaps more surprisingly, Prigozhin hasn't even kept a low profile since the June uprising. What was weird is that this guy didn't just disappear. Okay? He didn't just disappear. He came back to Russia. And he's like taking photos with people. You know, it's crazy. You got to disappear. He should have just went to Africa. They still would have killed him. They still would have killed him. But he might have bought himself a little time if he went to Africa. Like, he's in Russia. It's crazy. While subscribers to his Telegram, Telegram channel <laughs> have become accustomed to seeing him in camouflage and tactical gear, Prigozhin was spotted in a polo shirt and mom jeans Cutting a seemingly more mild manner figure than in months past. Yeah, he's got to die. <laughs> They're going to kill him. Are you nuts? Because, by the way, he got, you know what happened to him? He got famous. He got, like, really famous for that. And now he's losing his mind. He's doing glam shots in St. Petersburg in a, in a polo shirt. Like, I'm a famous guy now on the world stage. Sorry I tried to overthrow the government, but l listen... There's got to be equity in my brand, no? <laughs> Isn't there equity in this brand? It's it's old rules there. And I knew he was going to get it. I didn't know how he was going to get it. But I knew he was going to get it. It was no question. But all these articles that were coming out in the American press, which I understand, they're just writing articles to try to, you know, piss Putin off and whatever, make it seem like he has no control over the country. And again, I'm not, I'm not like bros with Vladimir Putin. One must say that now because people can't listen with the critical thought. It's no longer a faculty that most people in this country possess. Um, somebody tried to debate this with me on Instagram, and I never respond, but I started responding with voice memos to someone, and then eventually they were just like, well, I don't really have all the facts. It's like no one has all the facts, but this, this idea that you have to come out and tell people you don't, you, you're not, uh, uh, you don't adore Vladimir Putin to just call a spade a spade and say up is up and down is most likely down. And I knew that this guy probably wasn't going to get away with it. So let us fast forward. But again, you could see how out of his mind he is in the polo shirt. Look at this photo. He's out of his mind. He was, he was 
a week away from going back to being a chef. <laughs> That's how crazy he went. He was on a level of crazy where he was going to start food blogging soon. <laughs> like, he was going to be start... He He's trying to get on Chopped. Like, <laughs> he was trying to go backwards to when he was the chef. He was like, no, let's forget about the coup. Forget about, yeah, I lobbed a few heads off bygones. Everyone does. I shot a few Russian planes out of the air. Not a big deal. Let's go back to my real passion, food. Let's go back to my real passion. Like, there's, you know, in his crazy head, I know in his crazy head, because I've met a lot of people that are really famous, not like my level of fame, which is like, who cares? I'm talking about people that are genuinely like, they pop, they get really, really famous. And it is an interesting thing that happens in your head where the possibilities seem endless because uh, the people that are employed uh, to work with you, their job is to make the possibilities seem endless. So once you've gotten some level of fame, people, they sit around you in office buildings in Los Angeles and go, you know, you, you know, you could, you could do the Olympics. <laughs> Have you trained at all for the Olympics? No, I know you're 40 and fat, but there's got to be, what about curling? There's got to be an event <laughs> that you could get in. And even if you don't place top three, it's such great, there's so many eyeballs. There'll be so many eyeballs on you doing the Olympic. Like their job is not to live in reality. Their job is to make you feel like anything you ever wanted to do, not only is possible, but it's a good idea. It's a great idea. You want to make a song, having never sang? And have never had any musical day, do it. Do it. Studio's ready. You will be in the studio tomorrow. Taylor Swift, if she wants to act, she can act. She can do anything she wants. No one will tell Taylor. If Taylor Swift wanted to go in, into Russia and do what Wagner did, there would be people going, you know, I think we can do it. I think we can do it. Because no one will tell her no. She is the most powerful person are in this country right now because she's made a billion dollars. And when you make a billion dollars in the summer, <laughs> I can't even get people in Charlotte. <laughs> Charlotte, North Carolina, don't fuck with me. I've said horrible things about you, and I'll continue to, but buy the tickets. Don't start. September, what, 15th? Mm -hmm. My point is Taylor Swift's made a billion dollars. When you make a billion dollars in a summer, the person who tells you no will be thrown out of a window. <laughs> They will, you will never hear the word no. Anything she wants to do. If she wants to, like, perform on a... On, if she wants to take a 747 up there and do, like, concert in the sky and parachute it, like, no one will tell her no because she made a billion dollars on a tour in the summer. This is, this is you know, when you get that big, when you're that big. And Prigozhin did the Russian version of that. He tried to <laughs> take over Moscow. He tried to beat the Kremlin. That is the difference of the two countries. Uh. In America, our biggest star is Taylor Swift. In Russia, it was Evgeny Prigozhin because he tried to topple the Kremlin. And nothing gets more press in Russia than a war. Sure, they have pop stars. They have people that try to do it. They come out and they're like, <laughs> and they're, come on. And they're all, you know, they're drunk and they're in a club and it works. You know, everybody's trying to get laid and you can listen to that crap for a while, you know. <laughs> but they don't do what we do. They do war. They do coups. So Prigozhin's the guy, like, damn. But our Prigozhin is, is the person who made a billion dollars selling white girl nostalgia in the summer. Taylor Swift, God love her. Again, people say to me, why don't you like her? I go, no, 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 she's great. I just, again, I wasn't around. I was doing coke. I was selling mortgages. It wasn't for me. It wasn't for me. What happened to Kim Swazi? Get up, Kim Swazi. Remember that song? She was uh, Kim Swazi. And, and, you know, what is she doing now, bartending? When I was doing coke in clubs in Long Island, they would play people like Kim Swazi. S-U-O-Z-Z-I. And she had like two songs, which is all any entertainer of her caliber should ever have. And, and one of them was pretty good. I forget which one. It was the Alone song. Now, I don't know where this woman is. She's probably in Russia, but she, she did the song Alone. Play Alone. Play the video. Can we play the video or are we going to get clipped? Uh, I'd have to just have to file the copyright. Yeah. Ah, it's not worth it. My point is that I was listening to this idiot. 
doing coke and uh, uh, yeah, right. Uh, 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 this woman's serving lobster rolls right now. Montauk, she's probably broke. <laughs> My point is that I missed uh, Taylor Swift. Not that she's not good. It's you know, it's it is what it is, but. My point is that when Prigozhin thought he was Taylor Swift, I knew he was going to be dead. That's the whole game. I've always said that people uh, that are losing their hair should fight it like a war. Two out of three men will experience some form of hair loss by the time they are 35. More than 50 million men in the U.S. suffer from male pattern baldness. Noah Schnapp, I hear, is fully bald, but he's got a <laughs> wig. I'm kidding. I kid him. Uh, Keeps has more five-star reviews than any of its competitors. Because, you know, here's the deal with Keeps. I don't know if you know what it is. Um, but it is a expert-recommended hair loss treatment. It's a personalized treatment plan that's recommended by a licensed medical provider and delivered straight to your door. With Keeps, you get quality expert care without ever visiting a doctor's office or pharmacy. Easily subscribe to Keeps, and you'll get refill reminders. You'll never have to run low. Keeps as a network of medical advisors, prescribers, care specialists to support you. Each treatment comes with a full year of unlimited messaging so you can connect with your people anytime you want. Low cost. The treatment plans are affordable. They're typically half the cost of a pharmacy prices. Whether you're looking to prevent hair loss, stimulate hair growth, or just take better care of the hair you have, Keeps as you covered. Remember, prevention is key. Treatments take four to six months to see results, so act fast. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash Tim Dillon to receive your first month of treatment for free. That's keeps.com slash Tim Dillon to get your first month of treatment for free. keeps.com slash Tim Dillon, D-I-L-L-O-N. I was so stressed out trying to get Taylor Swift tickets that I couldn't even, I had a panic attack. I was laying on the floor. All my girlfriends, I was calling them. I'm like, bitches, like, what the F, you know? And it was hard. And I, you know, because it's, it was, it was the soundtrack of our lives at summer camp when I was like, you are my, th you know. <laughs> and so what happened was it was so tough. But now I use game time. I'm, that's what I use, game time, right? It's a fast and easy way to buy tickets for all sorts of sports, music, comedy, theater near you. Killer deals on last minute tickets and their best price guarantee. You can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for the, all the fun you'll have. Because that's what you, I was thinking about. Like, what am I wearing? What are we all going to wear when she does? My favorite one that she does is, um, is Ostrich. <laughs> it's like the craziest, most beautiful song that I remember. And it's beautiful from my childhood. It's, uh, she's like, you got a long neck like an ostrich. It's so good. Taylor Swift's song, Ostrich. You got a long neck. Like an ostrich. He's got a long neck like an ostrich. It's, oof, boy, it's powerful. It's powerful. <laughs> um, so go to Game Time. Get the app. Don't fuck around here, folks. Start doing this. Download the Game Time app. Create an account. Use code TIM for 20% off your first purchase. TIM, 20% off your first purchase. Because you don't have to, you can just, it, it's easy. You get the tickets. It's easy. It's not, fight. you know, there's so much fighting now with the family. Um, you could just go and hear um, Taylor Swift do a lot of her material because um, that's where I, I I was trying to get tickets to Taylor Swift and I couldn't because they were sold out. I started crying and it was bad. I just wanted to hear her do. There's a song she does that I really, really like. Um, um, I forget the name of it. It's, see, here's here's my conundrum right now. I'm going to tell the audience. Whatever I say now is going to get taken out of the ad. It would be very, very funny. <laughs> but whatever I say, like whatever song I say, is going to get removed. So just in your head, think of something I would have said that would have been funny because you would never have heard it anyway because this has happened before and we just have to take it out. But what what is real is the Game Time app. Create an account. Use TIM for 20% off your first purchase. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, low prices guaranteed. Now, let's talk about his death because it is. And now, they're Atlantic still doing it. Evgeny Prigozhin may have the last laugh. They won't stop. They won't stop these people at the Atlantic. No, no, no. He's still won. <laughs> he's still won. Remember, and by the way, haven't they said Putin's been dying for like seven years? Mm -hmm. 
They've said he said inoperable, incurable, everything for years and years and years. And he's you see him, he's fine. I think he's got doubles too, Putin, where he's got there's a lot of Putins in Russia that look like him. So they go out and it's kind of interesting. Again, it, it, we can learn from him a little bit. Can we say that? Obviously, he's done some <laughs> wrong things, many wrong things, but it is an interesting way to compare the two countries. This is a perfect way to look at the two countries. There is no way that you can't know the selfie squad ends. The selfies end. So what happened? What happened? Do we, he got in his plane. Do we have anything? Can we get a, maybe a Kremlin spokesperson to deny this? I, I don't think we, because they're all speaking Russian. It doesn't matter anyway. But the Kremlin said this has nothing to do with us. And then people came out and go, this is unprofessional. That Putin wouldn't be involved in this. I think Lukashenko, Belarus, he, the president of Belarus came out and was like, hey, uh, because by the way, never make a deal with that guy, huh? Mm. But he told them to watch out. Lukashenko, I read, he, he told them, he goes, listen guys, watch out. But, you know, he came out and he had to say, because he has to say it, he has to go, hey, this, you know, this isn't Putin's work. This is unprofessional. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems pretty professional to me. <laughs> it seems pretty, pretty good. But Lukashenko has to come out and go, no, 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 no. Um, it's actually, it's, um, it's, it's not what it seems. We don't know who did it. A lot of people are mad at him. A lot of people were angry. Nothing really happens in Russia, kind of without Putin's say-so at that level, right? Yeah. Um, so now people are saying explosion likely brought down aircraft purportedly carrying Wagner boss flight data and video uh, analysis. There is a puff of white, and then a plane can be seen failing, falling. A trail of smoke or vapor stretching behind it, descending rapidly against a bright blue sky. The person... Filming the video zooms is uh, as the aircraft spirals downwards out of control, revealing that it's missing a wing. Wow. Mm -hmm. You know, you think at the end he knew when the bomb went off. He knew. There was a split sec. There's always a few seconds to know. There's always a few seconds to go, fuck, you know? Yeah. As the end of the machine story, where Bert Kreischer goes, where the guy says to Bert Kreischer, goes, this is Russia. You know, like, I wonder if that's what, Evgeny Prigozhin thought as soon as that bomb went off, like, oh, this is Russia. So there is the plane. I don't know if you guys can see it. It's hard to see, but it is coming down at an altitude. I mean, it's coming down very quickly. And this is what happens, you know, obviously, if, a, if an explosion blows the wing off, it's over. It's over. A, lot, a plane can handle a lot, a lot of turbulence, a lot of different things. But when you blow the wing off, it's done. And you can see it, it just falls to the ground. And here's the other thing. Get up who was on that plane. Because, man, did they take everybody out. They took everybody out at once. And there, there's reported, now I don't know if this is true or not, that Prigozhin may have been on his way to see Putin in St. Petersburg. So he was taking off from Moscow. Um, the people in this plane were all high-level members of Wagner. They took everybody out. This was a mob hit where they killed an entire family. They went in and they whacked an entire family. So you've got Prigozhin, obviously. Dmitry Utkin, okay? He's one of Evgeny Prigozhin's top associates as well as the reputed operational leader of the Wagner Mercenary Group. Done. Um... Valery Yeganovich Chekalov. She's a he's a businessman who holds senior positions in Prigozhin's empire. Done. Yevgeny Marikan. Um, he was affiliated with Wagner. They don't know that much about him. Sergei Probutsin fought in the Second Chechen War and joined Wagner in March 2005. Nikolai Metsuzev. Um, they didn't know what his deal is. Alexander Totman, these are all the people on the manifest. The other non-crew passengers on the flight is Alexander Totman, whose call sign is Tot. Um, the center did not publish additional information about an apparent Wagner uh, member. And then, sadly, the crew members for the flight, um, which, by the way, I, I mean, can you imagine that, like getting that cr flight? You'd go, hey, uh... <laughs> Can I can I like fly a plane without an engine instead of this? Because 
it would be, imagine seeing that guy. Imagine you're a flight attendant in Moscow and you walk into work and you get your vodka and you pour it in the coffee or whatever they're doing. You get on, you put your lipstick on, you get the tits where they should be. I mean, it's still a, <laughs> it's still a country where I believe the flight attendants have to, you know, yeah. I think they have to, this is my guess. You know, not here where it's, I mean, Christ, right? I mean, I mean, the things that stalk the aisles of planes in this country, the half-dead army of mutants that, that just up and down the aisles. Ugh. Um, but you walk in and you, like, look out at everybody and then you're like, fuck. The guy who tried to overthrow the government is on the plane this morning. <laughs> and then you hear the explosion and it's over. And then it's over quickly. And it'll be, it'll be forgotten quickly and they'll move on. And this is what Russia does. This is the inevitable and only way that it can be resolved over there. There isn't, and this was the whole point of my kind of rant about it is just that it is interesting. It's why we're clearly the better country and the more fun country, you know, because a Yevgeny Prigozhin cooking show would be more fun. Yeah. That would be fun <laughs> to see him like try to be like a person after he just lobbed heads off. And he's like, the, the, the consistency of the soup is too thick. Um, but you could tell that's where he was going in his own mind. He, he lived a very interesting life. And RIP to him, him and my, the sad thing is him and my mother would have gotten along big time. They had the same ideas about Africa, by the way. But no, they, uh, they, would, have, they would have clearly probably gotten along, um, which is sad. Uh, but that, it was such an interesting thing, and it, it crystallized to me almost a difference, not, not necessarily between the old world and the new world. There's a lot of things going on in Russia. There's autocracies. Well, I'm not an idiot. But what I'm saying is that it is such a very interesting thing um, looking at how obvious it was to most people that have even a rudimentary understanding of that culture that his death warrant had been signed by his actions. But a lot of people in the American media, for whatever reason, were incapable of seeing that, perhaps mistaking Russia for this country where there may have been a path to redemption for him, as there would have been for Donald Trump if Donald Trump was just like, I, let's just go back to the drawing board. Let's go back to what works. I'm going to be entertaining. I'm going to call people, I'm going to call women fat and ugly, which no one can do anymore, but it needs to be done. I'm going to do it, and I'm going to have a, an empire of entertainment because that's all, you know, that's all fine in terms of like, he would have been allowed, there would have been, it would have been like, great. He would have been welcomed back immediately. He would have been kind of welcomed back in Hollywood. It would have taken maybe a year. Maybe, because that town, they couldn't have less uh, of, of, of a fixed idea of anything in that town. It's uh, everything and everybody, for the most part, is malleable. They are, uh, you know, um, they're liquid. They take the shape of the container. They are, you know, incredibly uh, easy to influence. Uh, and I think within a year, you would have seen Trump kind of climb back on the throne of being an entertainer. If he lived five years, he'd be hosting some big thing, and it would be all okay. And he would do jokes about January 6th, and people that think I'm kidding... I'm telling you, you do. I don't know. Are you new? Have you lived here? If he was able to live and he was able to stay funny and, you know, he didn't get dementia or something, he was still like George Burns, like those old guys that live forever, but they're still sharp. Don Rickles, people like that. If Trump still had it in a few years, there's no way that he would not have been welcomed back into the fray of the entertainment business where they're very comfortable with him. They're not comfortable with him in the White House. Um, so that's why they're indicting him. I mean, he's been indicted like, I wake up, he's indicted. I have breakfast after the breakfast burrito in a low-carb wrap, he's indicted. <laughs> he's indicted multiple times a day. How many times? Four. Four, yeah. Four, but the count, there's so many counts. It's maybe, so he's been indicted only four times, which is a lot, but there's counts upon count. I mean, it's like, they want him bad now. 
So they want they don't want him running for president, which is why I wonder if in hindsight now he's like I wonder if now now it's too late. But I feel like now he might be going like let me just do a show, <laughs> let me just do a show, let me do a show. I could do a good show. Netflix should get him out. Fox should bail him out of jail and go. We will make sure he doesn't run for president. Build a fake White House in LA. It's no the president doesn't have a lot of power anyway. It's not a big deal. Build a fake White House in a studio in Burbank. Let him think he's the president. <laughs> Let him do, pray. he'll have more power than the actual president, probably. Let him sit there and, and shit on people, make fun of them, say what he wants to say. He just doesn't have the nuclear football, but he can do all of that. That would have been a happy medium. But that's not, Prigozhin, that's not going to happen. You're not going to go back to being a chef you're not going to go back. Uh, you know, you're not going to be embraced after a few years with paintings. You go, I'm an artist now. He's not going to go on a Russian talk show in five years and go, I'm, an, oh, I'm actually an artist now. Take a look. See, what I did here with the oil on the canvas, take a look at that. I'm also doing mixed media now, which means I incorporate. <laughs> see, a lot of these are old news clippings that I fashioned through the, that's not it. That is not it. That is not the way it works over there. It is a cold culture of of, of uh, you know, final judgments over there that are harsh, that are doled out by the Kremlin and you get shot in the face or your plane blows up or you get poisoned. You do not get a TV show. You do not uh, pass go. You do not collect $200. You do not get the Russian version of Chopped. You don't go on Ellen and bring the art out and talk about how you're sorry about torturing everybody in the wars, but here, take a look at the art. You're really into that. You, you know, you've been painting a lot. You're not allowed to do any of that. It doesn't work. It's not O.J. Simpson where you could come out and be, after killing your wife, somehow the most rational guy on Twitter <laughs> and, like, genuinely a steward of this country now and the things he's saying have genuine weight and value and we should listen to them and we should find common ground politically. And every time I see him in that golf cart, I am like, wow, <laughs> I forget that he killed his wife and decapitated her friend. And there, it just not... He had one shot at redemption in Russia, and it wasn't really redemption. He got out of jail, and then he realized pretty quickly, oh, I'm committing the wrong crimes. I should be committing better crimes that make me more money, and I got to do that with the government. I can't commit crimes where the government is coming to get me. I have to commit crimes with the government. I'm broadcasting from New York today. Uh, a couple of buildings next to me, Goldman Sachs, had the same realization. <laughs> they had the same realization. Why we can't? How many women can we choke and grab the pearls, <laughs> and then have the government trying to get us? We got to work with the government. We got to commit crimes with the government. So it wasn't really a redemption arc. It was a shift in strategy. It was a shift in strategy. And he said, "Well, I cook these hot dogs. I make good hot dogs." And then he said, let's do that. And then the government said, here's what we're going to do. You're going to provide all the food. You're going to be the chef. And then he goes, okay. And then he started the Wagner PMC. And he goes, let's start doing this. And then he started the Internet Research Agency. He evolved TikTok clips. He did it. He, he did Internet Research Agency because like any uh, person who's, you know, trying to have a good career, you have to evolve and he evolved into, he goes, we need a troll farm. And he started the Internet Research Agency. He was indicted, by the way, in America. I don't know, I think he was indicted for his work, uh, supposedly, you know, and I'm sure he did fuck with the election over there, you know, by, I don't know, spreading, by giving my aunt rubles to post what she would have anyway on Facebook. But all the election interference stuff that we heard about at nauseum to no end was him which is why I found it slightly funny that when he was marching on Moscow, there were, it, we were gleeful here. There was glee, and people were going, Putin's hours are numbered, not even his days, his hours. This guy's going to take over. You go, oh, who's this guy? And you go, oh, the guy that supposedly uh, destroyed American democracy. So it was, that's why I was going, uh, huh? <laughs> Doesn't make much sense. But he met the fate that anybody who's paid attention... I've read books about Russia. Uh, it's an interesting culture. It's a fascinating culture. Anna Hashin said that I'm spiritually Russian because of the shape of my body and that I do like luxury <laughs> um, and that I do re relate to a lot of the oligarchs. And it's not, by the way, it's not 
They've done wrong things, but when they were taking all their boats, I didn't think that was right. I, and I went on the record with that. <laughs> I didn't think it was right. And a lot of these oligarchs, they're larger men, and they're on their yachts, they have their furs and their whores. And I thought it was <laughs> wrong. And spiritually, there's something Russian about me. I don't know. That's what she said. I didn't say it. She said it, but uh, she uh, was born there. I don't listen when women speak, but something about that. <laughs> now, although I will with fucking Barry Weiss, can you imagine this? So Barry Weiss, uh, writer, cultural critic, journalist. Um, uh, Barry Weiss called me and goes, I want you to moderate, a dis or not moderate, I want you to open a discussion. Elon and Zuckerberg are gonna, they're gonna have a big debate and it's going to be the biggest media event in the world. Would you do comedy before it and comment on it? And I said, absolutely. 1,000%. Well, then she called me back. And apparently a funny thing happened on the way to the forum because <laughs> it, uh, the lineup had changed. Instead of Elon, we got Grimes. And instead of Zuckerberg, we got Anna Hushan from the Red Scare podcast. Now, these women are uh, lovely women. But it was slightly different in terms of uh, media, event, potential, perhaps. Louise Perry's on this well as Sarah Hader. I don't know who these people are. I don't care. <laughs> now, it's the theater at Ace Hotel downtown LA. I'll be there. I'll be doing 20 minutes of comedy and some comment. I'm going to comment on this. Um, I can just imagine the Mossad going, this is what we're paying her to do. <laughs> this is what we're paying Barry Weiss to do. We're paying her to set up. Uh, you know, has the sexual revolution failed? I'll answer that, yes, because I'm there. It's four <laughs> women speaking and i showing up. But she's paying fairly and we respect her. And I'm just saying with the Russian oligarchs, I'm not saying that, I'm just saying, hey, let's all be nice. Is that nice, NATO? To take someone's jet when they've done nothing but self-fertilizer? <laughs> they didn't invade Ukraine. They're just selling for, of course, they killed a few people here and there, but they're just selling uh, fertilizer. And their boat's gone. So that's why I initially, you know, like there's that Richmond, North of Richmond song where that guy's, you know, it's a good song. He's talking about all the rich people trying to take everybody's lives and livelihoods and control everybody. We can't play it. We'll get in trouble. But this guy, respect to this guy. Um, he turned out a big record deal. He's like, I ain't not no different than nobody. And he's making killer money anyway. God bless him. He should stay independent. Uh, it would be hilarious if in six months he's like, I'm fighting Jake Paul. <laughs> I'm fighting. He just becomes a regular content creator. He's like, Jake Paul, get in the ring. Um, but yeah, it's a song. Everyone's like debating the political implications of it. It's a song, dummies. It will do nothing. It is a nice song. People should have music. Um... But I want to do a Richmond, north of Richmond, for the oligarchs of Russia. I want to record a song on a boat singing about the pain it is to be an oligarch who they take your fucking yacht. <laughs> I wanted to talk about this article, but that's Yevgeny Prigozhin. I want to talk about this. The Wall Street Journal's now uh, telling people, you know, they, they always do this. You know, Bloomberg uh, does this and CNB. They all do this. And there was that famous article uh, a while ago, uh, you'll own nothing and you'll like it. And now there's this article, and Drudge ran it uh, a while ago, where they're basically just saying to you, they're going, listen, we know you have an idea of what a house is. We know you have, like, an idea of what it is. But you got to get rid of that. And the title of the article, I'm not, I'm not um, kidding, okay? And again, all of these articles, by the way, are meant to be written so that you will accept... Lower and lower standards of living and think they're hip. That's the game. The game is that you have to think it's cool. Like the title of this article is Goodbye Bathtub and Living Room. America's homes are shrinking. Faced with high mortgage rates, cost-constrained Americans are embracing smaller homes. It's hip. It's cool. That's the angle. Eating bugs is fun. It's hip. It's cool. You don't want to be an old fucking boomer with a house and a yard, do you? This is the game. The game is to make the lower standards of living cool. Fee that, that you feel hip and young and you feel like it's, ooh, it's the zeitgeist to not have a kitchen. Isn't that the title go up? It says, what does it say? It goes, goodbye bathtub and living room. <laughs> 
hello, prison cell. <laughs> Goodbye, bathtub and living room. America's homes are shrinking. Like Americans are, and by the way, they're embracing, look at the word, you. they're embracing smaller, embraces what you do when you love someone, you hug them. They're not settling. Now, an honest article would be, goodbye bathtub and living room, America's homes are shrinking, Americans are settling for smaller homes. But they don't want that. They go, Americans are embracing smaller homes. They like it. It's good. It's nice when people come over your house to everyone stands in a hallway and talks. It's nice. Why do you need a living room? Let's read this uh, article. I love when I when I when I see an article like this, I send it to like twenty people. It, it always makes me laugh. For many Americans, home ownership may be attainable only if they give up a dining room. Home prices are near record highs, frustrating millions of potential buyers who feel priced out of the housing market. Home builders are having to find ways to make their product more affordable to to increase their pool of customers. Shrinking the size of a new single-family home is an increasingly popular way to do it. Smaller homes can help cost-constrained buyers face high, facing high mortgage rates. They also boost the bottom line for building. <laughs> and here we are. They also boost the bottom line for builders who are contending with spiraling labor and construction costs. Now, by the way, the people building these homes, it's not like mom and pop, two Italian guys who are, like, building the home. Like, hey, it's fucking Rocco. He's building a home. These are um, these are massive uh, companies that build these homes, right? They're private equity companies own all these home builders, right? What's that big home builder? D H D L. Yeah, there's K K and B. What's the other one? It's all over North Carolina. D H something. D H Horton or something. Home builder like. Yeah, D R Horton. Yeah, yeah D R Horton, America's largest home builder. So what? These are corporate structures. So when we talk about home builders, like people think it's like, hey, I got a little juice in the deal for my baby, Giuseppe. We're building your home. We need to make a little money. We need to make a little scratch. How's my wife, Anna Maria, going to have um, um, enough money for the cheese? That's not what this is, right? This is corporate, massive companies going, we need to find a way to make even more money so, no dining room, no living room. It's not intimate. Home sizes are shrinking. The most in some of the hotter markets. The Seattle area, where the size of a newly built home is 18% smaller than it was five years ago, tops the list. New homes in Charlotte, North Carolina, and San Antonio shrank by 14%. Most builders and architects follow the same basic playbook to produce tighter, more efficient living spaces. They are axing dining areas bathtubs, and separate living rooms. Secondary bedrooms and loft spaces are shrinking and sometimes disappearing. You all sleep in the same bed and fuck each other. <laughs> At the same time, they're increasing the size of multi-use rooms like kitchens and great rooms, shared spaces like bunk rooms, Jack and Jill bathrooms, which are the worst things ever, where it's like one door, you're like in the bathroom, and then the door's opening, and you're like, no! Um, in, in, in some cases, the kitchen island has become the only eating area in the home, which is great. It's lovely to have a holiday at a kitchen island. <laughs> There's nothing better than a Thanksgiving dinner at a kitchen island. But if we're a godless country where nobody even celebrates the holidays. But let's say we do occasionally, right? We like Thanksgiving. That's the one with food. Um, and there's nothing better than sitting in a kitchen island, uh, eating Thanksgiving dinner, sitting... Uh, parallel to your family, not looking at anyone in the eye, not having to look at them, <laughs> which is great because everyone's, you know, everybody's on 15 anti-anxiety medications and everybody's like, you know, a, a, somewhere on a spectrum so nobody can make eye contact. So this is nice. You just sit on the kitchen island for Thanksgiving and you stare at the stove. And if someone asks you a question, you don't even have to crane your head to look at them. You just <laughs> stare at the stove. School is good. <laughs> Climate change... Um, Estridge Homes, a semi-custom new home builder that operates near Indianapolis, recently launched a new neighborhood concept with detached homes, 300 to 500 square feet smaller and fifty dollars to $75,000 cheaper than it typically builds. Now listen, America has crazy big homes. We don't need the biggest homes in the world, right? We have these massive McMansions, rooms and rooms and rooms that people don't use, right? I, I understand that. There's a lot to criticize with that, you know? Um... 
But what they are saying is that, God forbid, any of the corporate parent companies that own all these home builders lose a dollar, they're just going to convince people that having a room to eat in for a holiday is a luxury. That's a luxury. Having a living room is a luxury. Uh, and we're, we're, you know, it, basically it's like, you know the uh, room at the prison that everyone eats in? <laughs> Let's do that. Every house will be designed to look like a big uh, a penal colony, a big prison room where you could just sit on a floor and eat. And if you want to do it, if you want to sit at a table, it, you do it in a kitchen. That's great. So they're going to convince people that a dining room is a luxury because they don't want to lose any money, really. They don't want to lose any money. They want these big margins, and the people that run those companies have a lot of fucking money. It's not independent mom-and-pop contractors. This is massive corporate, big home builders, big landlords, Blackstone, places like this that own all the fucking houses. These are the people making these decisions. So it's not like... This is not like we're getting European, by the way. And go, go. To, I wonder who owns D.H. Horton, how big their home is, right? It's like, it's not about, like, being more environmentally conscious and sustainability. It's not about going, we don't need 6,000 square feet. It's about convincing Americans that a, a living room or a dining room is a luxury that they do not need because uh, the people that... Our billionaires need uh, more billions and billions and billions of dollars. Where is this guy's house? There's no way you're going to find his house. It would be in a uh, uh, CEO rating. He'll comparably. Oh, you're no. not going to find the CEO of <clears throat> D.H. Horton's house. Yeah. I guarantee it's not small. <laughs> I'm going to bet you that the CEO of D.H. Horton has a dining room. David. Old. Old. You want to take that bet that he has a living room? And a dining room, soon they're going to go, multiple bathrooms are being eliminated. You have one indoor bathroom, and then you have an outdoor bathroom. We'll go back to outhouses. We'll say that's cool. Actually, it's very it's good for your back to sit in the outhouse. It's actually better for your digestive tract to use the bathroom outside. That's the direction that we're going to go in, and it's all because people don't want to shrink any of the more. I just love the idea that it's a living room and a dining room. But They're not saying limit the bedrooms. They're like, no, we don't, no, 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 no dining room. No dining room. How, where are you going to come out as trans to your family? At the <laughs> kitchen island? That doesn't make any sense. Mom and dad, I think I'm a girl. At the kitchen island? You're not even going to give a kid a dining room to tell their folks they're non-binary? <laughs> that they're gender fluid? They're going to have to do it in the fucking kitchen like an animal? Does that make any sense to anybody? It doesn't make any sense to me. Poor Evgeny Prigozhin. Poor guy. Thought he was. He thought he was Taylor Swift. That guy thought he was fucking Taylor Swift. Another article in the journal. They want people to be older. They want people to live longer. In this crazy country, how we age and how scientists are working to turn back the clock. Could there be anything worse than trying to keep people on this planet longer? <laughs> Is there a worse idea? Prigozhin tried to overthrow the government later in life. That's not a young man's move. Later in life, that's when Trump got elected. Like, later in life's when it gets fun. That's when you go wild. Later in life, you go, who cares? Shoot for the moon. Who gives a fuck? I'm not going to be around that much longer. So that is when you can, people got to check out. When people get to that point where they, they go, I don't have to live with the consequences of this, that's when they got to go. That's not when we, we shouldn't be trying to make people into 110-year-olds here. Because at 95, they're going to go, maybe Hitler was right. It's what happens. They call this roadmap the hallmarks of aging, a set of biological features and mechanism linked to our inexorable march towards death. Over the past decade, decade, the hallmarks have helped guide the development of drugs that clear away cells, that have, that have stopped dividing, and gene therapies that appear to restore cells to a more youthful state. I'm all against this, by the way. This endless, prolonged life is such a bad idea in this country. This country, we're going to have people in their 90s who are youthful and fit and ready to start problems. We're going to be putting 90-year-olds in jail for bar fights. I mean, I, it's just no... It, could there be a worse idea than having 100-year-old people with a spring in their step 
Do you see these 40, 50, 60-year-old boomers walking around Vegas? You want to see what that looks like 40 years down the line? If they're still healthy? Can you imagine that? The only thing that stops people in this country is death. It's the only thing that gets even close to stopping them. Otherwise, it's just forget it. I'm 97, and I'm here. And I, Can you imagine the level of entitlement these boomers would have at 100? I've been on this earth 100 years, and you're telling me this table's not ready yet? 100 years? These people are going to live? The boomers are the worst generation on earth. We're going to keep them here? We're going to keep them here. They're already behaving erratically. You know, the idea that we're going to keep them here for years and years and years so that they can turn around and go, I have 90 years of experience. <laughs> and they could be out and complaining is the craziest thing that I have ever seen. It's insane. Taylor Swift can stay. Give her all the anti-aging stuff. Get the, <laughs> get the boomers out of here. TimDillonComedy.com for all of the dates. I'm in Philly. It's 30 minutes outside of Philly. Who cares? Do drugs, get in a car. <laughs> September 8th and 9th, uh, Los Angeles, the Barry Weiss crap on the 13th. Charlotte, North Carolina on the 15th. Buy tickets to that North Carolina. I know I've said bad things about you. Lexington, Kentucky, Cincinnati, Ohio, Davenport, Iowa, Des Moines, Iowa, Omaha, Nebraska, Wheatland, Wheatland California. It's really Sacramento. Um, and then I'm in Australia, Perth, Adelaide, Sydney, Brisbane, Melbourne, going to New Zealand, Auckland, Christchurch, Rochester, New York, New York, New York, Carnegie Hall, amazing stand-up, and then a podcast with Ray Kump. Uh, we're doing Pittsburgh the day after that. I'm doing that. Detroit um, and Toronto in December. Thank you, everybody. Subscribe uh, to the podcast. Share it with your friends if you want. We're on Patreon every week. In addition to YouTube, um, what am what are, what do we? It's a weird time because my mother died and Prigozhin died. It's very weird. It's very interesting to 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 kind of it's uh, you think about life and I and I and I think his ultimate flaw was going. I am Taylor Swift, and in Russia there is no Taylor Swift, sir. You will swiftly <laughs> be dealt a blow. No, he. You could see it. You could see the joy in him. You could see his brush with fame. You could see he thought it was America. He thought he was Taylor Swift. He thought he was going to go on the Eras tour. But he did not. It's Russia, baby. It's a different game. And, uh, you know, and he knew it. The minute that bomb went off, this is a guy who's lived and died by the sword, there was a moment of respect because he, the, you know, some of the biggest resets you have in your life are in a minute, in a moment, right? David Carr was a media columnist for the Times, wrote a book called The Night of the Gun. And it was about it. We were smoking crack and he looked at his children in the car and he said, I was prepared to be a bad person, but I was not prepared to be a bad father. So on a dime, he goes, I got to get help. I got to change my life. There are all kinds of instances where people change your life on a dime. They have this white light moment, you know? And so sometimes you could get a reset and sometimes it'll happen instantaneously where, you know, the, 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 the chariot or whatever it is becomes a pumpkin. It's Snow White. It's like this, not Snow White, Cinderella, the stroke of midnight. Everything goes back to the way it was, you know, the stroke of midnight. We put this some time on the clock. But at the stroke of midnight, everything's going to go back to the way it was. The, the carriage will become a pumpkin. And all of a sudden, you were this glamorous princess, but you're going back to what you were, just kind of a cute girl who lives on the outskirts of the castle with these demon sisters who hate you. That's what your life becomes at midnight. And his midnight was in that plane... In Moscow, when he's sitting there, he's got his group around him. He's like, wait a minute. I Now, by the way, how funny just thinking of Putin and all the Kremlin just watching this show. They're just sitting in the palace in St. Petersburg watching it. And they they all have translators on. And every now and then, Putin goes like this to the screen. He goes. But in the, in, 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 up in the air, he's sitting there and the bomb goes off. 
And there's a minute where he goes, what was that? And then there's a second where he knows exactly what happened. And he's got all his people around. Because you got to remember, he's on the flight. He's flying high. He's got all his guys. He goes, oh, my God, look, nothing's changed. I'm still this guy. In fact, I'm bigger than ever. I'm on the Eras Tour. He was on the Eras Tour with his people in the jet. And then the minute that bomb went off and the and the wing of the plane was no longer visible and he started... You only get a second because then the G-forces get you to the point where it's just like it's over. But the split second, he knew what it was when the clock struck midnight and the and the and the you know the the fucking uh, the uh, carriage became a pumpkin, or in his case, the jet became a missile, hurling to the ground. He remembered what he really is. You're not Taylor Swift. You're not on the Eras tour. You're in Russia, and that's the way it happens. From someone who's not Russian, but who is spiritually Russian, I explain that to you. Good night, everyone. I wish you well. As always, bye-bye.